Hi, everyone. We're going to get started now. Um, we might have more people trickling in, but um, I want to welcome you all to our Dark Matter Day event. Um, my name is Madeline O'Keefe. I'm the communications specialist for the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory and its main institution, um, the Wisconsin Ice Cube Particle Astrophysics Center, or WIPAC, um, and we are located at UW-Madison. Um, so today we are gonna have a wonderful trio of talks by a few of Ice Cube's dark matter researchers. We'll have uh, Jeff Lazar, Nadej Yuvin, and Carlos Arguelles. And um, I think Ice Cube is sometimes known as an neutrino observatory. You know, we do a lot of neutrino physics, but uh, we also do dark matter research and that's what we wanna showcase and highlight for you all today. So we'll do questions at the end. If you have any questions, um, you can leave them in the Q&A box. If you are on the Zoom webinar um, uh, app, there is a, a box at the bottom that says Q&A and you can leave any questions there um, or in the chat. Um, if you're joining us on YouTube, you can leave a comment and we'll try to get those as well. But um, we're going to start off with Jeff Lazar. Uh, Jeff, you are welcome to start screen sharing your slides. Jeff, are you, uh, all right, there we go, thanks. Oops, sorry about that, Jeff, let me. Cool. Am I? Uh... Yeah, we can hear you now. Sorry about that. Okay. No worries. Okay. Cool. Um. So let's. I think you're seeing the good slides now. Yes. Perfect. Uh, hi everyone. So I'm uh, Jeff Lazar. I'm gonna do a brief uh, introduction to um, sort of uh, dark matter, what we know about dark matter, um, and some background on that. I'm going to talk a little bit about neutrinos, and I'll talk about um, my work in particular, which has to do with uh, observing um, sort of like dark matter in the sun. Uh, so uh, sort of starting off, what do we know about uh, dark matter? Um, we know that it uh, interacts with regular matter via gravity. So, you know, it um, has mass and so it can uh, interact with gravity. Um, it makes up about 85% of matter in the universe. Um, so that it's, uh, it lives over here in this purple section of the pie chart. Um, this blue section is dark energy, which I'm not going to talk about today. Um, it's for another time. And then our sort of like normal matter that we understand lives in this uh, pretty tiny sliver over here um, and makes up only 5% uh, of the energy content of the universe. Um, we also know that it must be slow moving. Um, so it has to be, it can't be zipping around really fast. Um, and we don't really know much else. Uh, so um, physicists are pretty creative people. And so they've made a bunch of sort of, uh, there's a bunch of like dark matter candidates. Um, uh, so these can be WIMPs, axions, dark photons, primordial black holes, on and on and on. Um, and so I'm gonna focus on WIMPs today, which are uh, a kind of particle dark matter. Uh, so I'll explain a little bit more about that in a couple slides. Um, but first I wanted to answer sort of how do we know what we know? Like how do we determine the things I said on the last slide? Um, so here we have a picture of the, the Milky Way galaxy. Um, the sun's here and then the galactic center is here. Um, and as you can see, most of the mass is concentrated sort of out here. And then as you get farther away or most of the regular matter, which is most of the mass is here. As you get farther away, it sort of uh, gets sparser and sparser. Um, and as you can kind of see in this, uh, um, by the like spiral shape of this galaxy, uh, the Milky Way is rotating. And uh, if you've ever ridden one of those rides at the carnival that like spins you around, you know that things sort of tend to like fly backwards when they're spinning around. Um, and so 
we need something to hold the, the stuff out here in, um, and that forces gravity. And so since most of the matter is here, um, or I, I guess I should say, the, the faster you spin, the more likely you are to get thrown out, and so the stronger force you need to counteract that. But since most of the gravity is here and gravity gets weaker as you move away, um, we would expect the stuff in the extremity, the extremities of the galaxy to, uh, to be rotating less quickly. Um, so that's sort of what I'm showing on this uh, little schematic. So we would expect something like the, the dotted line. So this is the speed, um, and this is how far you are from the center. So it can sort of spin fastest when it's close to the galactic center, and then it has to slow down um, so that it doesn't get thrown away. But when we look at our galaxy and other galaxies like it, we see something that more looks more like the solid line, where it flattens out towards the top. And so it stays moving fast even as you get far away from where most of the sort of like matter that we understand is. And so this uh, leads us to suspect that, or leads us to conclude that there are, uh, there's matter um, sort of all throughout this, even in the places where it sort of doesn't look like it. Um, and so similar measurements with uh, gravity, like by measuring how much gravitational force you need um, and comparing that to the amount of mass you have, uh, have been performed um, at many, many scales. And they all sort of come back to the same conclusion that we need much more matter than the matter we can see. Um, so I also claimed that uh, dark matter is slow moving. And so the way we know this is that if, so uh, if dark matter is zipping around, it's gonna be harder for gravity to sort of like hold it together and for dark matter to clump up. And so this, uh, since there's so much dark matter, the regular matter is going to sort of follow clumps of dark matter, and that's gonna to lead to like galaxy formation. Um, so if you have fast dark matter, you get this sort of uh, very sparse uh, look. So this is sort of the a view of the universe where each of these little dots is a galaxy or a group of a cluster of galaxies. So in the slow dark matter scenario, you get more clumping of dark matter and then more galaxies and galactic clusters in these uh, sort of outside regions versus for fast dark matter, less clumping and sort of sparser uh, distribution. So we can simulate dark matter at various speeds and see what that looks like. And then we can go and look around and see what our universe looks like. And um, it looks much more like the slow dark matter scenario. Um, so uh, that's, you know, that we know just a few things, uh, but we probably wanna know more. So if in the case of particle dark matter, um, we can sort of model its interaction with normal matter by introducing a new, what we would think of as a new force. And so the mechanisms for this are very well established there. Uh, you know, we know how to do that very well. Um, and so we can, yeah, just sort of without knowing exactly what's gonna happen, sort of uh, just, you know, leave that as a, a little bit of a question mark and see, or leave it as an open variable, I guess, in our problem. And so we can uh, broadly do this as um, in three different ways. Uh, you can make it, you can shake it, or you can break it. Um, so the make it is what they do at um, uh, particle accelerators. They smash two uh, regular uh, sort of matter particles together. And um, there's some chance that two dark matter particles can come out. Um, and so this would look like missing energy in your detector. Uh, and so you can shake it, which is uh, um, where a dark matter crashes into a thing of regu with regular matter and gives it some of its energy. So this looks like more energy than you expect. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you just look for more, en yeah, more energy than you expect in your detector, or you can break it, um, which is when you look for, um, uh, you look for the standard model byproducts of two dark matter go in, two standard model particles, or two regular matter particles come out. Um, so this is sort of the inverse of the make it. Um, so I'm going to focus on uh, this last scenario, um, but before I can tell you exactly how this works, I'm going to tell you a bit about the standard model particle that we look for, which is the neutrino. Um, so this was first proposed to conserve uh, or to preserve energy conservation um, by uh, Wolfgang Pauli. Um, and so uh, he was a little bit pessimistic that we would ever uh, see them uh, because they are, uh, they interact very seldomly. Um, but uh, fortunately for me, uh, he was wrong, because and I have a job uh, detecting um, neutrinos. Um, but just to give you a, uh, a sense of the abundance of neutrinos and how uh, rare it is for them to interact, 70 billion 
uh, pass through your thumbnail every second without um, really anything happening. We only expect that two of these 70 billion per second uh, will interact in your lifetime. Um, but so since interactions are so rare, we need to build a huge detector. Um, and so uh, the project that I work on is called the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory. It's uh, at the geographic South Pole. And it's basically just um, about, about 5,000 light detectors buried between a mile and a mile and a half beneath the Antarctic ice. Um, so you see on each of these little blue lines, there are 86 of these light detectors. Um, and so what happens is if a neutrino comes through, if it has an interaction, um, the particles it creates uh, will give off light, which we then uh, sort of can, uh, you know, uh, the light detectors see that. Um, and so we know that there is a neutrino interaction. Um, and so this is a sort of zoomed in look of the detector. Each of the uh, each of these circles is one of those light detectors. Um, and if it's cut, if it's colored, it means that it saw light. And so uh, red circle means that it was earlier, green circle um, means that it was later. And so you can sort of uh, follow um, the path of the particle, the particle to point back to where it came from. Uh, so this is uh, important because in this sense, we are sort of like a telescope. We see things coming from uh, outer space and we are able to point back to where they came from. Uh, and so um, just to give you a sense of the scale of sort of the detector and these interactions, I'm now in Boston. Um, and this is a picture of uh, that event um, superimposed over the Boston continent. So you can see it is taller than pretty much every building in Boston um, and spans, you know, five or six city blocks. Um, so these are, uh, yeah, pretty huge, pretty huge detector, pretty huge events. Um, uh, so how are dark matter and neutrinos, or how, how are the sun and dark matter and neutrinos connected? So the way this works is we have our, we got our sun here, we got our Earth here. We got a little dark matter matter floating around in in space, um, so it can crash into a, a sort of um, a particle in the sun, and then uh, um, lose some energy. And then if this happens a couple times, it loses enough energy that it just sort of sinks to the uh, the center of the sun. And this will happen over and over and over. And so we get this like excess of dark matter, sort of a, a clumping at the center of the sun. Um, these can then uh, sort of, we do that uh, break it scenario where two dark matter come in and then neutrinos can come out and we can observe the, uh, those neutrinos over at uh, the ice cube detector. Um, so yeah, the strategy is simple. We just look for um, an excess of neutrinos above uh, on this, the uh, very well understood backgrounds coming from the direction of the sun. Um, so this is uh, sort of my primary uh, area of research. Unfortunately, I don't have any uh, results I can share today because um, you know uh, we're not at that stage. Um, but that's the general idea. Um, so in summary, uh, we strongly suspect that there's dark matter, but we don't know very much about it. Um, we can probe uh, uh, particle dark matter by making it, shaking it, or breaking it, um, and then. Uh, Neutrinos are um, very useful for uh, these indirect detection searches, which are the, the break it um, uh, model, um, because they can escape from this, uh, the dense environments like the sun. Um, and uh, so the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory can look for dark matter by searching for a neutrino excess from the direction of the sun. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you for listening and I'll pass it off. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, I think there are already a couple questions, but if you don't mind, we'll hold off till the end um, yeah. to address those. So thank you, Jeff. And we're gonna go on to Nadej next, who uh, also looks for dark matter with Ice Cube, but uh, from a kind of different way. So Nadej, if you are able to start sharing and all that, I can give the floor to you. Hello. 
Okay, so I'm Nadej and I'm a PhD student from Brussels. We will now consider another dark matter search, but this time we will focus on the galactic center. So as you saw in the previous talk, we expect, we expect dark matter to accumulate gravitationally at the center of massive objects such as the Earth or the Sun. But observation also suggests that galaxies are surrounded by dark matter halos with an increased density toward the center which means that we can also search for dark matter at the um, center of uh, our galaxy in the galactic halo, or even in uh, clusters of galaxy or uh, dwarf spheroidal galaxies. So even if we have an end or where we should look for dark matter, we don't know uh, what it is made of. And here are a couple of candidates. Um, which are represented along with the visible matter, so what we know of. And uh, you might know some of them, so the neutrons, protons, photons, electrons, neutrinos, and so on. And among the dark matter candidates uh, shown here, we will focus on the WIMPs. So as Jeff already told, WIMPs are weakly interacting massive particles, and these are um, the most common considered candidates for dark matter. And a few of the characteristics of WIMPs uh, is first that they need to be massive particles because we need to explain the missing mass um, Jeff uh, explained before. They also need to be stable for the age of the universe because we still see the effects of dark matter today. They have to be neutral, so they are not interacting electromagnetically. Um, it is still possible, however, that they interact through a weak interaction. And also um, they have to be non-relativistic, which means that they have a relatively low speed with respect to the speed of light. So as you recall from the previous talk, there is three ways to search for uh, dark matter particles, the direct detection or shake it, the indirect detection or break it, and the uh, production at collider where you make uh, dark matter. And for this analysis, we will focus on the second option, which is indirect detection. And more specifically, we will be interested by neutrinos produced by the interaction, uh, sorry, the annihilation of uh, dark matter. So in order to observe these neutrinos, we need a detector. And in our case, this would be ice cube. So uh, as you heard, Ice Cube is a cubic kilometer telescope, which is located at the South Pole. It is composed of over 5,000 um, photon photosensors, which are located on 86 strings, oops, sorry, 86 strings, uh, which are buried in the Antarctic ice. And in the center of the detec detector, you have a denser subdetector, which is called deep core. Okay, so before going any further, let me give you a brief reminder about neutrinos. So these are neutral particles with a really small mass, which interact only weakly with matter. And there is three types of them, the electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, and tau neutrinos. These neutrinos are only observed indirectly um, as they are deduced from their interaction in or around the detector. So when they interact, they will produce charged particles. And in turn, these particles will, will produce um, terrain of light as they move through the transparent medium, which is, in our case, the ice. And this light can then be detected by the photosensors of ice cube. So what exactly are we looking for? So as I said previously, what we search for um, is um, are neutrinos produced by the annihilation of dark matter in the galactic center. And concretely, this means that we will look for an excess of neutrinos coming from the galactic center. And to do that, we compare our data, so that is to say our measurements, to what we expect from uh, the background and the signal um, estimations. So, <clears throat> Um, let us uh, see what is our background. So IceCube was built to search for astrophysical neutrinos, but we can also see atmospheric neutrinos in the detector. And these neutrinos are produced by the interaction of cosmic rays with the upper atmosphere. 
this interaction will create a uh, shower of particles with, as I said, among them neutrinos, which can find their way uh, to ice cube. And in these um, showers, you can also find what we uh, call atmospheric muons, which can also be detected by ice cube. So atmospheric neutrinos and muons are um, the background of ice cube. Then there is a distinction to make between uh, events which are coming from um, below the horizon of ice cube, which are uh, the upgoing events, and uh, above the horizon of ice cube, which will be downgoing in the, in the detector. So if you look at this plot, you can see that for upgoing events, so event going up in the detector, you get rid of all the contribution from atmospheric muons. And this is because um, on the contrary of neutrinos, atmospheric muons can't travel all the way through Earth. So this means that the Earth acts as a shield against these atmospheric muons. While if you look at events coming from this uh, region of the sky, you still get this uh, big contribution from atmospheric muons. Unfortunately for us, the galactic center is located in this region where uh, you have the contribution from um, atmospheric muons. So we need to get rid of this part of the background. And to do that, we can use a veto. So what we do is that we consider the outer layer um, of ice cube as a veto. So everything in that region will not be uh, taken into account to, for the measurements, but will be used as our veto region. <clears throat> so um, events originating from neutrinos will be able to travel, um, so will be able to pass that uh, veto. So here you can see one. So if you have a neutrino coming, it will um, not like create any light up until the time it interacts. So we consider only the events which are interacting within the um, veto detector. So when they interact, neutrinos will create charged particles, which in turn will create light. And we can um, detect this light. If, on the contrary, we saw directly uh, light in the veto region, we know it's already a charged particle coming through, and therefore, uh, in this case, a, um, a muon, so an atmospheric muon. Uh, okay, so now that we know better about our um, background, we need to simulate our signal expectation. And uh, we can estimate the number of expected neutrinos from dark matter annihilation in the galactic center from theory. So the signal expectation depends on a couple of parameters. The first thing uh, is the uh, dark matter mass. Um, then there is also the dark matter uh, annihilation channel. So as I told you, um, dark matter, when it annihilates, can create standard model particles, and um, this will eventually give us neutrinos. However, the process like um, in between those two steps, so in between like dark matter and neutrinos, is still like um, it's still unknown. So we uh, test for a different couple of annihilation channels, so a different couples of particles, like visible matter particles, dark matter first annihilates to. Then there is also um, the dark matter allo profile. So uh, if you remember, I told you that the galaxy, so the Milky Way is surrounded by a dark matter allo. Um, but we don't know uh, the shape of this halo. So we uh, expect a, an increased uh, density of dark matter at the center of the halo, but we don't know if it's like really peaked uh, and we have a lot of dark matter at the center and it decreased um, like fast to the edge or if it's like smoother and like the transition is, uh, there is actually not like, that much uh, more dark matter at the center compared to the edge. Okay, so 
Before showing you the results of the uh, analysis, I have to talk to you about another neutrino telescope, which is called Antares. And this is because the results I'm about to show you were actually computed by combine, combining the data of both IceCube and Antares. So Antares is a neutrino telescope, which is located in the Mediterranean Sea. It is composed of 12 strings, which are anchored to the seabed and covering a surface of 0 0.1 um, square kilometer. So you might uh, think that this is way smaller than IceCube, which is a cubic kilometer uh, detector, but actually uh, it has an advantage. So it is located in the Northern hemisphere. So it means that they will see uh, events coming from the galactic center as upgoing in the detector, which, sorry, which means that um, they don't need a veto uh, as we did with IceCube because they already uh, can get rid of the atmospheric muons just by using the Earth. So this means that in the end, the size of the vetoed ice cube, so ice cube like where you don't take the edge, uh, the edges, is actually almost the same size as uh, this uh, smaller detector. Okay, so now this brings me to the results. So the question uh, you might want to ask immediately is, have we found dark matter? And the answer unfortunately is no, but we can still get more, um, more useful information out of our analysis than just, we did not find dark matter. And that is that we are able to constrain some of the properties of dark matter and more specifically, the dark matter annihilation cross-section. So the annihilation cross-section measures the probability of dark matter uh, annihilation to happen. And um, it is computed for a specific mass annihilation channel and allo profile. So the three things I told you about before. So going into our signal simulation. And um, these plots are showing you the results. So they might seem a little complicated at first. So let me guide you through them. So each plot is for a different allo profile. So the one on the left is for uh, allo profile, which is really peaked at the center and decrease like rapidly. And the other one is for a more flat um, profile. Then there is the annihilation channels. So each line in different colors represents an annihilation channel. So this is the particle into which dark matter annihilates first. So we tested a couple here, exactly four, a couple of um, particles. Um, and then for, as for the mass, the mass range that we considered is the um, horizontal axis. So what we are really interested in, the information that we want to know is uh, on the y-axis, which is the annihilation cross-section. So the limit on the annihilation cross-section is basically that if you look at these curves, um, the information to take out is that everything above the curves are ruled out. So it means that we already restricted um, a couple of um, uh, annihilation cross sections, okay? So in conclusion, even though we have strong observational evidence in favor of dark matter, its nature remains unknown. For this uh, analysis, we carry the search for neutrinos from dark matter annihilation and we looked toward the galactic centers since we expect uh, an higher dark matter density at the center of our galaxy. So far, we found no excess uh, of neutrinos from the galactic center, but however, uh, we were still able to constrain dark matter uh, properties and more specifically the um, dark matter annihilation cross-section. So yeah, that's already it for me. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Nadej. That was wonderful. Um, and I think a couple more questions came up, but again, we will wait for one more presentation. Um, next is Carlos Arguelles. 
professor. Um, and yeah, Carlos, whenever you are ready, you may go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for the invitation and thank you everybody for, for being here. Um, both previous presentations were really nice. Um, and today I want to talk to you about um, looking for dark matter with high energy neutrinos, uh, which relates to the previous talks you have heard about. Um, oops, what did I do? So this is a this is a picture of the Andromeda galaxy, which is the closest galaxy we have to our own galaxy, the Milky Way. Uh, this is a piece, picture of the Andromeda ga galaxy in visible light. So that's the light that we can see with our eyes and was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And so this light that you see here, um, you know, is emitted by stars, much like our own sun and our charged particles that can be producing or emitting light around the galaxy. But the Andromeda galaxy, and its constituents of so stars and particles in it not only emit visible light, they also emit light in other different frequencies, and that's still photons, so still particles of light, but they have different frequencies associated to them. So here you can see the Andromeda galaxy in radio to X-ray, um, where the radio is the lowest energy photons and the X-rays in this figure is the higher energy photons. And so you can see that different parts of the galaxy emit less or more of different uh, types of light. Um, so then the question is uh, if the Andromeda galaxy could be emitting not only photons, but it could also be emitting neutrinos. Um, so, so far we do not know if Andromeda emits neutrinos, but we think that there is a good chance that it emits neutrinos. And the question is, do other galaxies emit neutrinos? Um, and then the answer to that we think is, is yes. So we have seen neutrinos um, that are these neutral particles coming from uh, galaxies that are very far away. In particular, uh, about a couple of years ago, we saw a 4 billion year old 300 TeV neutrino that came from a blazer. A blazer is a particular type of galaxy that's emitting a very high intensity stream of particles in the direction of the Earth. Um, and we recognize this as a source of as the source of neutrinos because these neutrinos, when they were observed, were seen in conscience with uh, a very high energy gamma ray. So this, this object, this very far away uh, galaxy uh, called TXS 0506 plus 056, um, it's known then to emit neutrinos and gamma rays. So there are other places that not only emit photons, not only emit light, but also emit neutrinos. So this leads us to a question of how does the universe look in neutrinos? If we could half our eyes be not like photon eyes or light eyes, if they could be neutrino eyes, and we could look at the sky, what, what would we see? So we cannot use our eyes, but we can use the Ice Cream Routine Observatory that was described by Jeff and Adesh in their earlier talks. And we can look at the highest energy of neutrinos observed by the Ice Cream Routine Observatory and those neutrinos we believe are most likely of extraterrestrial origin. Uh, most of these neutrinos uh, have unidentified sources, so they are not connected to a galaxy like, like I showed you in the earlier slide. And so what you see here is this uh, sky map in, in equatorial coordinates. So the galaxy is along that um, um, gray line on it. And these different hotspots you see are different uh, locations where we think an astrophysical or extraterrestrial neutrino came from. And so this is how it looks. If we could, you know, if you could see the brightest 
you know, objects, you know, trinos, uh, this is and the highest energy ones, this is what you will see uh, in the sky. And the question that I'm trying to answer is these neutrinos, um, some of those, as we know, come from that galaxy I was showing you earlier, but can these neutrinos come from dark matter? And our way to think about it is, does dark matter, which we know is dark, it means that it doesn't emit light, but does it shine, does it emit neutrinos? Uh, so that like I was saying earlier, um, we do not know how dark matter connects to the standard model of particle physics, which describes the current constituents of, of matter. Um, but in many of these theories, you would end up producing uh, neutrinos, gamma rays, electrons, and protons. Um, and there are some theories where dark matter would only actually uh, literally shine in, in, in neutrinos. So what we're trying to do, like Nadesh explained earlier, is to look for these uh, neutrinos that come from dark matter. Okay, so I can look at my sky map of dark matter, um, sorry, of neutrinos that we see in the Ice Observatory, and I can see does this match what I would expect from dark matter making neutrinos. And so the answer of that is an unfortunate no. So. What you see here on this leftmost plot, which is like this black color here, is uh, the horizontal axis is the right ascension, which is just some direction in the Earth, and the sign of delta, delta is another direction in the Earth. What matters here in this plot on the left is this yellow square. This yellow square is the location of the galactic center. And like Nadesh was saying earlier, the galactic center is where most of these most of the dark matter accumulates closest to us, which means that if the dark matter will be shining in neutrinos, it will be making these neutrinos, um, that means I will should see many, many neutrinos come from that yellow square, which is where the galactic center is. And what you see here then are crosses and X in this black background. Those crosses and Xs uh, they are the locations of the neutrinos we have seen in Ice Cube that we believe are of extraterrestrial origin. And you see that the extraterrestrial neutrinos come from places that are very far away from that white spot, and they do not seem to really cluster around that white area. So that means that most of the extraterrestrial neutrinos that we see uh, are not of due to dark matter making those neutrinos, but maybe galaxies or other things making them, we don't know. Uh, so you can translate that into what Nadesh was introduced earlier, which is how likely is it for a dark matter to dark matter to hit each other and produce neutrinos, which we label in this plot on the right as a vertical axis, as a cross-section of interaction. And we have these constraints now that we can tell you Dark matter cannot make neutrinos uh, at a given rate at the highest energies. It's also possible that dark matter is unstable. Uh, we know that dark matter is very stable uh, because it has to last essentially order age of the universe. Uh, but we also know it's very abundant. So if it's a little, little unstable, it's still okay. Uh, and it could make some more particles, in particular, it could make neutrino. It so happens that if dark matter is unstable, um, now the region where it produces neutrinos broader. So now you have to look at the plot on the left here. And you see now there is this yellow region, but now the yellow region is larger. Uh, so now it explains, you know, maybe one third of the region is where dark matter could come from. Uh, it's still, we have many processes that are not in that location. So we still can say, most of the neutrinos cannot be from dark matter decaying. And so we put constraints on how unstable the dark matter is. And so we showed that so in the left, in the right plot, where the vertical axis is the lifetime. Or so how long does that typical dark matter particle live? And the horizontal axis is its mass. So now I want to talk about something else um, which connects to dark matter and these neutrinos. So I've been talking about um looking at the universe in, in in light and looking at the universe in neutrinos and asking if these neutrinos come from extra particles 
Um, so when you want to look at the stars, you probably don't want to, you want nothing to block you. And in particular, if I put my hand and just look at the sun and put my hand in between them, now I cannot look and look at the sun. And the reason is that my hand has enough atoms to, you know, stop photons. So it's just stop the, the visible light emitted by the sun. It doesn't stop all the light. There are some light frequencies that can make it through. But you can stop the visible light. So can you stop neutrinos? If I put my hand and, you know, point to a galaxy, I have a block, can I stop the neutrinos from that galaxy? Uh, and the answer is essentially no. Um, neutrinos, like I mentioned, are very weakly interacting particles. And at their lowest energies that we have seen, they can easily go to 200 planets Earth before having any interaction. Which means that if I put my hand, you know, the neutrinos keep going and this is actually what you see here in the location of the hand is a picture of the sun in neutrinos taken by a super Kamiokande experiment. And to give you an idea of how many neutrinos the sun emits, the sun emits, um, there are too many zeros to put in this number, but I think it's 2 billion, 200 billion neutrinos per second. Uh, so that's a lot of them. And then you can just not stop them. So that means that um, a normal astronomer, you know, they want to have nothing blocking them. They can be in their mountain looking at the stars. A neutrino astronomer, we are typically underground where everything is blocking. And the only thing that we can see is the neutrinos that can make it to us. So then the other question that I want to ask is, OK, so we know that normal matter typically cannot stop neutrinos. But can, can dark matter, can dark matter stop neutrinos? So if I have neutrinos coming along to me and I put a chunk of dark matter, can dark matter stop these neutrinos? Um, and we have looked into this in Ice Cube because we see astrophysical neutrinos and these neutrinos are coming from really, really far away. So they're going through very long distances of uh, dark matter uh, particles. So they're going through many dark matter particles uh, and we still see neutrinos from those. So what happens is here's the planet, here's the galactic center here in the center of this plot. So if you have neutrinos coming in along this direction, they have to go to a larger matter content where neutrinos will go orthogonal to the galactic center where there's less dark matter, uh, see less dark matter interactions. And they can go through us. And what you expect to see is essentially a deficit of neutrinos. Um, so here is again that sky map I was showing you of the neutrinos we think are extragalactic. And like I was saying, they seem to come from every direction. Um, so we believe so now that neutrinos are unstopped uh, from dark matter. So what you see here is the color scale is the dark matter density. And there is more dark matter in the center. Uh, it looks like there are no neutrinos from the center in this plot because there are no crosses. But believe me, if you actually do a statistical analysis, this is compatible um, with it just being OK for neutrinos to go through that point. So it's an accident. And with this information, with this ability of the neutrinos going through dark matter, we can constrain how the dark matter interacts with neutrinos. I'm just going to show you these plots. But essentially, what you do is you assume that dark matter and neutrinos interact in some particular way, and you see how many neutrinos you get from the electric center uh, that would be blocked by dark matter otherwise. Um, I'm going to skip this. Um, so we have found evidence for astrophysical uh, neutrinos. Um, uh, we do not know what is not, if the neutrinos are coming from dark matter. We think most of them are not. Um, but we still it's still a mystery where these neutrinos are coming from. Uh, and so far, it seems that neutrinos uh, can go to large amounts of dark matter. But that's only so far, because we're still studying this. And with that, uh, thank you, Oswan. Thank you, Carlos. That was wonderful. Um, thank you to all three of our presenters. Um, we're going to move into the Q&A now. Uh, and yeah, if you would like to come back on camera, that is great. Um, so I'll hop into the, the Q&A box here. If you have any questions, again, feel free to leave them in the chat or the Q&A um, part of the app. The first question, um, I think for Jeff, how exactly does the dark matter interact with the sun? Yeah, so um, that is somewhat open, but as Carlos was talking about, you can um, do this uh, 
like sort of, it, it, so it would be model dependent. So you have a, a sort of dark matter model that tells you exactly what the interaction that would allow that is. And so you would then sort of uh, put constraints on the model parameters from your uh, observation of dark matter or lack of observation. Um, but yeah, so, but in a, in a lot of sort of very general extensions of our current understanding of particle physics, these interactions um, do exist. All right. Um, and is dark matter expected to affect nucleosynthesis predictions? Um, so I, I assume this is it talking about nucleosynthesis in the sun. So, so like uh, production, okay. Um, not that I know of, I haven't seen any predictions on that. My guess would be no, just because the, we imagine that the dark matter cross section with normal matter is lower than the cross section of normal matter with normal matter in these nuclear processes. But I am kind of just shooting from the hip on that. Yeah, this is a really tricky question. I I think I am with Jeff on this one that my guess would be no. Though, if you have very light dark matter, like KV scale dark matter, which is extremely light, dark matter can modify the thermodynamics of the sun. And if dark matter modifies the thermodynamics of the sun, then it could modify that as well. Oh, uh, what about Big Bang nucleosynthesis? Yeah. Um, the, I think there are predictions on that. Um, there are certainly papers about that. I don't know exactly how it modifies Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Carlos might know more about that, I would say. Or maybe he does. So it has to do with, so Big Bang nucleosynthesis happens as a particular time in the evolution of the universe and that matter genetically does affect that. Um, I don't think it's the most sensitive probe or dark matter. Like there are things that it more efficiently affects in cosmological observables, like the structure of light from the CMB or large structure. Um, my guess is that it does affect it, but it's, I'm not sure how, if it's the most significant probe for it. All right. Um, all right, we'll move on to the next one. How can you say an excess of neutrinos when such a large amount travel and pass through us? Is there a constant kind of limit past which we say this is an excess? Anyone may hop in since you all kind of touch on that. You want to take it, Nadesh? Or else I can... I mean, you can go on. I think the next two questions are for me already. Okay, so so neutrinos typically pass um, matter and stop, um, but some of them will actually hit matter and make light, or particles that make light. Um, so we say that um, so they definitely can be observed. Now, what would we call an excess? Um, we have uh, an idea of the sources of neutrinos um, in the in the planet. So we know how many neutrinos are produced in the atmosphere, in the earth, in reactors, and so on and so forth. And so we know, let's say, you're supposed to see 100 neutrinos per day. So we know the error on that measurement. And when it's statistically significantly higher than that error, we claim there is an excess. So it relies on understanding uh, how many neutrinos you expect from Earth sources. Um, and then making a statistical analysis on that. Um, I hope that answers the question. But if it doesn't, please uh, um, formulate that in maybe in another way. Yeah, feel free to follow up uh, with any of your questions. But um, we'll go to the next one. Um, I think Nadej can answer. So when the dark matter particles hit each other and create a neutrino, is that like when antiparticles of normal matter annihilate each other? 
If so, then does that annihilation produce dark matter or is it more like virtual particles of Hawking radiation or something completely different? Okay, so I mean the process is uh, we still we have no clue. Basically, there is um, theories, of course, but as we said, we don't know what happens when uh, particles, dark matter particles, annihilate. What we expect, however, is I mean what we hope for in order to detect dark matter in the indirect way as we want to do with Ice Cube, we expect and we, and we hope that they will create when they annihilate. Um, standard modern particles, among which neutrinos that we could detect. But the process is, uh, yeah, it's very unclear. I don't know if any of you has anything to add. All right, um, we have actually a question from YouTube. Um, and the question is, are sterile neutrinos also a candidate for dark matter? Here's another question for me, I guess. Uh, <laughs> good, very good question. Um, the answer is nominally yes. It depends on the mass of sterile neutrino. So let me just say what sterile neutrino is. So we know there are three neutrino species. Those we know as active neutrinos, but there could be more neutrino species. Uh, and those are generally thought to be uh, more massive. Uh, and those could be their matter. Typically, their masses are above, like, or their KV is higher in mass. Um, and there have been some hints in the last um, decade that there is some uh, excess of photons um, from certain galaxies that could be sterile neutrino of order KV masses decaying into, into light. Uh, that is very controversial still, uh, but yes, definitely they could be if they're massive enough. All right, exciting stuff. Um, next question, uh, I think this is also for Nadej. Can you comment again on the expected excess of neutrinos from the Galactic Center? What physical processes, processes can you rule out based upon the upper limits of current neutrino limits from the Galactic Center? Okay, so what we mean by excess is that we search, so as I said, we compare our data to what we expect from signal and background. And so basically we search for a specific signal signature. And if we see events that looks like that, they will like come out like because they will like be really different from the background events. So that's why, I mean, we can, we can like really distinguish them um, and if there were any. And um, what process we can rule out. So, um, so I guess it's from, yeah. Uh, so basically uh, the plots I showed you were uh, showing the limits on the uh, annihilation cross-section. And so we can't rule the entire process. So we can't rule out like the entire process of dark matter annihilating, but we can like um, rule out a part of it. So basically we can just say um, that the probability of it happening is lower than the line we show. So it's, it's the, it, like the, the cross section above that is ruled out, but not the entire process. I don't know if it was clear. I think so, but if, if people have follow-ups, feel free to okay. ask. Um, how is the source of the neutrinos determined, whether it's from the center of the galaxy or the sun or from another source? Great question. If any of you want to jump in. Yes, so I think we can't like say with certainty that any neutrino came from any particular place, but we understand what the, so on a neutrino by neutrino basis, we cannot say whether it came from uh, um, whether it came from the sun or whether it came from the galactic center or anything, but we know uh, sort of on average how many we should see coming from a particular uh, direction for over a particular period of time, uh, and so a lot of work goes into like quantifying that number so that you can then say if you saw a, something above that number. Um, 
like more than you would expect um that some other process that you're uh i don't want to say not accounting for but that there's an additional process creating neutrinos um sort of from that direction All right. Does anyone else want to add to that or can move on? Um, yeah, so we have a raised hand. Um, Aaron, Vincent, would you like to, I can allow you to talk if you'd like to ask a question. You can now unmute yourself if you would like. Sorry, I clicked that on accident. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but hi, everyone. <laughs> hi, thanks hi. for coming. Um, Okay, let's go to the next question. Um, the universe is extremely big. How do physicists know that there is 28% dark matter? Is it theoretically or experimentally? Jeff had talked a little bit about this, I think, at the beginning. Yeah, so there's um, like very, uh, I believe the 28% comes from cosmology. There's sort of a, a required uh, amount of matter to, uh, hmm, how do we, uh, so there's a, a, an amount of matter you need to um, achieve some condition that we're pretty sure is true about the universe. It's called having a flat geometry. Um, and so you can do, so that's like a theoretical sort of concern because it comes from general relativity. Um, but then you, uh, um, you can then like look around. So there are these like large uh, as like surveys of like sort of all the all sky surveys to get a sense of the like large structure, large scale structure of the universe. Um, and so you can take the amount of mass you need minus the amount of mass you see and that gives you the the twenty eight percent number, I think. All right. Um, unless anyone else wants to add on to that, I'll keep going. Um, so, what is required uh, to measure neutrinos associated with the Big Bang? Is there a CMB equivalent for neutrinos? Um, and whoever wants to answer this, can you also give like? sentence explanation of the CMB? Yeah, I can try to answer this question. So the neutrinos, um, after the Big Bang happened, um, there is some remnant light that is produced, which is known as the cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, and similarly, there is also supposed to be uh, an emission of neutrinos in the early universe. And these neutrinos in the early universe um, have by now very low energies. Um, and so this is a question related to how can we observe these neutrinos from the CMB, uh, from the Big Bang. Um, these neutrinos have extremely low energies. So they're essentially, um, at least one of them is uh, at rest or, or it's non-relativistic as, as we say it. Um, and the other one, the other two is are still unclear, uh, but they have very low energies. What, which means that it's very hard to detect uh, because neutrinos interactions are rare, and you need to see a rare process that deposits a very small amount of of energy. Uh, so that's very challenging experimentally. There are ideas to do this. Um, one of those experiments is called Ptolemy, um, where you essentially have a source of, not, of, of, of neutrinos, um, well, of really a particle that uh, emits neutrinos and electrons. Um, and you can see the, um, um, the neutrinos from the cosmic background hitting this, uh, the same electron emitter. And we know that this emitter, if nothing is hitting it, emits at most a given energy of electrons so if you see electrons certainly have higher energy than you see uh, that, that that source can produce, it means that that source was hit by um, something and that something could be um, cosmic neutrinos. Um, 
So there, is, there are some ideas of how to do this, uh, but we are still quite far away to see this. Thanks, Carlos. Um, so it is one o'clock, well, it's actually a little bit past. Um, if uh, the panelists are available to stay and answer a couple more questions, um, we can do that. Otherwise, if you need to sign off, feel free. Um, but I'll keep checking ahead with a couple more um, since we have a couple good ones here. Um, there is a question about like, is there a place for engineers in research facilities or observatories like IceCube? Um, this attendee is going to study engineering, but is also very interested in physics. Uh, I'm inclined to say yes. Um, I believe we have quite a few engineers, if anyone else wants to elaborate. Yeah, a lot of our staff is like electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, we have to build things. The physicists don't know how to do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So please, if you're interested, keep keep learning about us. Um, why is it preferable to have the neutrino detectors underground? Um, and I think each of you touched on it a little bit. Um, if you wanna reiterate at all. Um, yeah, I can take it. So we know that neutrinos, they interact um, really weakly. So we need um, a big detector uh, to be able to detect them. I mean, we want them to interact. So if like uh, the denser the medium, the better it is. Like through in air, there is less probability that it will interact. Um, so that's why. And why do we use, for example, um, ice in our case or um, water like uh, ocean, I mean, sea water for uh, Antares? It's because we need a large volume of, of transparent medium to use the Cherenkov effect, so to see the light. Um, I mean, for the light to be produced. And so it is one of the cheapest like um, way to get such a large volume of a transparent medium, like using something that is already there, so the ice or the, uh, the water. Thanks, Nadej. Um, yeah, quite a few neutrino detectors around the world are underground, in fact. Um, so let's see, uh, since the neutrino's mass is so low, would that mean it probably barely interacts with gravity? And if so, would it be able to enter the ergosphere or the event horizon uh, of a spinning black hole and escape? Um, so photons also have a really small mass, but um, nothing uh, can uh, escape a black hole. So you can enter, that's for sure. So you can, you can uh, I go uh, through the event horizon, but coming back is not a possibility even for neutrinos, even for light. So yeah. Darn, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Okay, um, we have someone asking, we'll just do like a couple more and then can let you all go. But um, we have a question about the degrees you need to be eligible to work at Ice Cube. Um, this is from a 16 year old who is still deciding on what to study in college. Yeah, what did you all study to, to get your jobs now? I studied physics. Same for me, I'm master in physics and now a PhD. And Jeff? Oh, sorry. Yeah, math and physics. Math and physics. All right. Yeah. So, but as, as they said, you can also do, uh, there's many engineers that work on this stuff as well. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like the engineers are often the ones that can go to the South Pole since they know how the, uh, the stuff works, installing um, instruments, things like that, fixing things. Um, all right, let's see. Um, if you look at the image of the cosmic microwave background radiation from the Planck satellite, 
Um, it shows the makeup of the early universe. This image helps eliminate the theory that vast structures formed first that broke up, thus eliminating neutrinos as a source of dark matter. So the question is, how come we are still researching about it? Yeah, so let me reply that. I think that we are not saying in these talks that neutrinos or the three neutrinos that we observe, we know are dark matter. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're saying that matter is something that's heavy, uh, yet unknown, and it connects to standard model in, a, in, in very given ways. Um, uh, and many of these connections to a standard model produce neutrinos after the fact. So you're right, you know, the neutrinos cannot be the dark matter, um, but dark matter can be in something else, produce neutrinos once it interacts or it decays. All right, thank you, Carlos. Um, let's wrap up with one more um, from the YouTube video stream. I've always been curious uh, if dark matter forms a halo around all massive ob objects and how exactly does dark matter interact with black holes? Um, the halo sounds like something I judge touched on. Sorry, I did not uh, get the question. Oh yeah, it's um, it's in our chat box also. Um, okay. I've been always curious of if dark matter forms a halo around all massive objects and how exactly does dark matter interact with the black holes? Okay, uh, okay. So basically um, for the allo um, so I was talking about, it's a different process. So for uh, local sources such as the Earth or the Sun, we expect uh, dark matter to be captured by the object. Actually, for um, like the halo, it's kind of the opposite. We, ex we, I mean, it's more like regular matter gathered where galactic, uh, where dark matter was um, like in higher concentration and then formed uh, like galaxies and everything there. So it's not that dark matter went around regular matter, it's more like regular matter went where there were um, higher concentration of dark matter. So it's a completely different process. Okay, thank you, Adej. Um, I think we're gonna wrap it up there since I have uh, we've kept you all later um, than we initially promised, but I want to say thank you again to Carlos, Jeff, and Adej for their wonderful talks, for answering all of your great questions. Thanks to everyone who attended. Um, this has been recorded and will be live on YouTube as soon as we finish here. So um, thank you so much again um, and enjoy Dark Matter Day, which is officially this Saturday. There's lots of other events happening around the world. You can go to darkmatterday.com and uh, learn a lot more about it. And we also have our social media um, links are in the chat if you're interested in learning more about IceCube. So thanks so much, everyone.